Thought you said we lost him. I found you all! Woo! Thank goodness for that star. If it weren't for that star, I wouldn't have found you guys. Woo! Pretty convenient that now you can read the stars. Oh no, just that big super bright one. I mean, it's like, boom, blam! But I'm still gonna need directions home. Can someone write that down for me? We don't have time for this. We're going to see the Messiah. Look at us, the four wise men. We're inseparable. More like insufferable. Speaking of suffering, my feet can't take much more walking. It's been three years. We should have been home by now. You guys can blame me all day for losing those camels, but you all knew going into this that my double hitch knot needed a little work. <clears throat> Why don't we proceed in silence, reverent silence? in honor of the Messiah. Totally cool with that. Good. So, I was thinking about my gift. I mean, what baby needs white jade anyway, right? <laughs> We've been over this a thousand times. White jade represents his purity and goodness. The gold represents his royalty. The burning of frankincense reminds us that the aura of God is around us at all times, and the myrrh is to anoint him as king of kings. Right, 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 right. Just listen, listen. I think, I think I found a better gift. A gift that'll make everyone forget that I lost the white jade. You what? I mean, I think a gift that makes the white jade just look like nothing. A gift that's better than the white jade that I replaced. You replaced with what? The greatest gift of all. Oh, yeah. Wait for it. Wait for it. Bum-blam! Hummus! <laughs> you must be kidding. Do you mean, you must be kidding? Because <laughs> I'm not, I'm not kidding at all. Hummus is delicious, okay? And, and it's very, it's very symbolic. People unite together when they see hummus. Much like a saint. Okay. okay. This is my bad. This is on me. You guys go see the Messiah. I'll just stay here. I think that would be best. But at least you have a snack. Yeah. I just thought it just doesn't matter what we bring this little king. He doesn't need any of our gifts. I mean, you know, he's a savior. I mean, he's a He's a gift to us. Maybe I was hoping he's bigger than all my mistakes. Yeah, I guess that's what I was hoping. All right, I'll see you guys later. Why are you doing that? Because I hope he's that kind of a savior too. Let's go. I wish someone had some pita bread. Bum-blam! Now, I've told you lots of times that I don't like seeing the Magi in the Nativity. But they are an important part of the story, right? And it's so funny to me because it is. We always talk about the three wise men. We just sing, we three kings. In here, you know, the joke is always that it's the fourth one that screws up. And I saw, you could find, if you go and you search for it, you'll find all sorts of silly videos about the fourth wise man that did a poor job. I watched another one where they brought, they, they gathered together and they were ready with their gold and their frankincense and their myrrh. And the fourth one came in and he had a gift card and it was expired and it didn't work very well. And, you know, but the funny thing is, we don't really have any indication that there were three of them, except that there were three gifts. More likely, many more than three of them that were going together. Um, but we do know about the gifts. They brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. And I find myself, you know, this video, what I like about it is I find myself thinking, I want to be, as I told the kids, I want to bring the gold. I want to be the guy that brings the, the thing that has real value, not just symbolic value, 
right? And I want, I want, you know, Mary and Joseph, I want the parents of this infant king to see that I'm the generous one. I'm the one that brought the great thing. And I, I notice that sometimes I, you know, you catch yourselves around Christmas time, we kind of do that same thing. We started off this series as we led up the series that we, we just uh, uh, did during Christmas, the, the gift exchange, watching a video of that same thing where, where they were supposed to spend $15 and people started spending hundreds uh, and, and going above and beyond. And sometimes we, it becomes a big old competition about who could give the best gift to each other. Or you catch yourself looking around going, did my parents spend more money on my brother than they did me? I'm not cool with that either, right? My parents were always so concerned about equality that they would not only spend the same amount on each of us, but they will they will make sure that you have the same number of gifts as well. So, like even now, as we gathered in at my parents this week with my with my uh, siblings and their kids, and and we had Christmas all together. Sometimes. You received, when you got a present, it had just the one thing. Sometimes you'd open a box and there'd be four things in there, and it was because they only wanted you to open three different presents. And so some of us in one present would have multiples just because they wanted the numbers to work. Because heaven forbid we think that it's unequal, right? It's unfair. We don't want to get caught uh, being unfair to each other really makes me think about the kingdom. We had just done this series called Kingdom Selfies leading up to Christmas, and we were looking at what Jesus said about the kingdom of God. And then Christmas season, you know, the, the giving of gifts when we talk about love and peace and joy and hope, and we talk about the Christmas spirit, and we see that even in, in secular culture, we talk about the Christmas spirit, the spirit of giving, doing kind things for each other, all that kind of stuff. That's really representative of the kingdom of God anyway. Those things that we learn about at Advent season and those Christmas spirit kinds of things, ultimately those are really just the values of the kingdom of God being played out because of a holiday. And so I wanted to kind of work back into that discussion about the kingdom of God because we really haven't left it during Advent. And and it's so important for us to, to extend it beyond the time of Christmas. That Christmas spirit stuff is really about living out the kingdom of God in this world. And it doesn't happen just in December. So what does that mean? Uh, We looked before Christmas uh, at several of the things Jesus said about the kingdom of God. We looked at the Sermon on the Mount a couple times. Some of the things that he taught about, about loving people, even those we didn't like very much or those that hated us. We talked about many things as he described the the kingdom of God. But what we're going to do for a few weeks now is look at some of his parables. Some of the ways that he told stories to help us understand what this kingdom is really about. And this first one I want to look at really connects with that idea of fairness, of giving, of looking at what someone else has. If you would, turn with me to Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. I think this is one of the most challenging of Jesus' parables. It's also one that's kind of a watershed. You you read it and you see it one of two ways, and it kind of depends on your perspective how you may read it. Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16, this is what it says. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? They answered, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. 
When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. As I said, this is a parable that, depending on your perspective, you may read it one of two two different ways. The first one is, is... I would guess more likely the way you read it, the way I certainly read it initially as well. Injustice. This is not fair. Those that worked only an hour made the same money as the people that worked all stinking day. Everybody made the same. Whether you came in the morning, at 9, at noon, at 3, at 5, whatever it was, you all got paid the same. And it just isn't fair. And I've been in those circumstances where I feel like that. I worked harder than you. I've done more than you. Why do you get the same as I do? It's interesting that this story is found only in Matthew. Matthew is written to the Jews. Matthew is written to to kind of show Jesus as the fulfillment of the prophecies so that the, the Jewish people will understand that he is that he is truly uh, the Messiah that they've been waiting for. And probably the Jews that heard this would feel this way. Injustice. Because we also see that in the early church, as the Gospels were making their way around the churches, as Peter and the apostles, as Paul came into view, as they began to preach throughout the the known world, more and more Gentiles, non-Jewish people, were coming to faith in Christ and were accepted as full brothers and sisters in the the body. And, And Jewish believers are going, wait a minute, we've been here all along. We've been following God from the very beginning. We can trace it all the way back to Abraham. All the way through. Injustice. This isn't fair. We've been faithful. They don't deserve what we get. Certainly, the religious leaders would have heard this parable that Jesus told and felt that way. Because they especially have done everything right. They've built their entire lives around never breaking a rule. Never messing up the law. Doing every specific thing correct. And therefore, they believe They deserve rewards for that. God will reward them most compared to those that do so little. It's very easy to read this story and see that injustice. It feels off because it really isn't fair. But there's a second way to read this story. And this is the way you read this story if you were one of those workers that showed up at 3 o'clock or 5 o'clock and were picked up and taken and, and all of a sudden you go and, and it says at the beginning that the earliest workers he promised a denarius, which is basically a day's, a day's wages. I mean, what would be typical of one day of work? So he promises them a specific amount. But the rest of the time he says, I'll give you what is fair. Well, if, if I got hired at five o'clock and we're shutting down at six, what is fair is probably my expectations pretty light, right? Because I know how long I worked. I know what I did. But if you read this story as one of those people, instead of seeing injustice, you see generosity. Can you imagine coming in, working for an hour, and being paid like you were there all day? What a gift that would be. 
What a blessing. What an amazing landowner. What a, I mean, I'll work for this guy anytime. I mean, he came in and he, and he invited us to come and work, and we didn't have to work that long, and he still paid us a ton of money. I never expected it. What a generous person. I know that I didn't deserve it. If I worked an hour, I know what I deserve. What a generous gift that he gave. So why does Jesus tell this story? For a couple reasons. He he wants to to give us an an image of the kingdom. He wants us to see that the kingdom isn't working the way that we think it works. And certainly he's wanting those that are there listening to him at that time to shift their thinking about what justice is. Because for the most part, they still believe in karma. Karma. No matter what their history is, as God's people is, they continue to believe what is just kind of that natural belief, which is, if I do the right things, I'll get more. If I do wrong things, I'll get worse, right? And so that's why you see them over and over again say, hey, that person's blind. What did he do wrong to to earn his blindness? Where Jesus says, nothing. That's not how this works. And so he's still battling that perspective. And we still have a lot of that. I mean, I hear about that a lot even today, where we think, even as believers so often, when something goes wrong in my life, if, I'm, if someone gets sick or, or dies or, or something, I, you know, I lose a job, my first thinking is, well, what did I do wrong that God is punishing me? What, what did I do wrong that I earned this terrible situation? Jesus is coming up against that. But he's also teaching us something about his character and, and, and about what it means for us to actually follow him. And it's because we can't just read the story by itself. We have to read it in the context of, of it. And it's the beginning of a chapter, so it's easy to just turn to Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. It's the beginning of a chapter. It starts here. But the Bible isn't written that way. We added chapters and verses later. So actually, we need to back up and see what happened right before. So if you back up a page to to Matthew 19, this is what happened right before this story. It says this, starting in verse 16. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? You see the question's already off. Teacher, what good thing must I do to, to get eternal life? Jesus responds, as he often does, with a question. Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. Then he answered them. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I've kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go Sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad, because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus asked, them, looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What, will, what then will there be for us? You notice the perspective of Peter? We started working in the morning. We've given up everything. What will be for us? Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will still will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last. And many who are last will be first. It is after he has this encounter with both the the young man who came and asked him the question and then his disciples who 
push him even further. It is directly after this that he says, let me tell you a story about a vineyard. Everybody's asking about how good a thing they've been doing for me. The man said, I've kept all the commandments. I do everything I'm supposed to do. What what else do you need from me? And, you know, I hear some I hear some cockiness in his voice. You know, I hear some, look at me, Master, look at how great I am. What am I missing? And Jesus pushes him and he says, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, come follow me, and you're in. And what does it say? The man walked away sad because he had great wealth. He had done everything right according to him. But what mattered still more was what he had. And then his disciples come and they're like, hey, I don't get this. We've been following you all this time. We've been sacrificing. We've been doing all this stuff. What does that mean for us? Jesus challenges the, the, the way they think about the kingdom. He challenges this man's obedience and says, you may think that you've got it all right, but you don't. You still are missing something challenges his own disciples and says, yes, you're going to experience rewards, but let me tell you a story about workers in a vineyard. Ultimately, it comes down to this. What is enough to earn the kingdom of God? Nothing. There is nothing that is enough to earn it. It is simply the generosity of God that calls us back to himself. The kingdom of God relies on the generosity of God. You haven't done enough, no matter how long you've worked, no matter how obedient you've been, no matter how much you've sacrificed, you haven't done enough to earn the rewards of God. But God chooses, because of his love, to generously pay you what you do not deserve. God chooses to generously invite you back into relationship with him, even though we've messed it up. What do we get from this parable? One, it reminds us that we've got to stop comparing ourselves to each other. Our blessings are what we have, what we experience. We do this so quickly. I've worked harder than you. I deserve better than you. And we do that so often that we're paying attention to what somebody else has and we're trying to, to, to compare and, and, and rationalize what we should have instead. There's a TV show where there's this encounter with a, a dad and his daughter and his daughter sees that her sister has something that she, she got a piece of candy that, that that the daughter didn't get. And she's upset. And she comes to her dad and she says, this isn't fair. I want one of those two. And there's only, there was only one and she got it. And now it's not fair and I want one. And he turns to her and he tries to explain to her this simple thing. And he says it this way. The only time you should be looking in your neighbor's bowl is to make sure she has enough. You don't look in your neighbor's bowl to see if you have as much as them. You only look to see if they need more so that you can help them get it. So often we catch ourselves looking in each other's bowl, not because we want to help them, we want to make sure they have enough, but because we want to make sure we have a little bit more. We want to make sure they're not getting anything that we don't get. But the kingdom of God is not about that. The kingdom of God is not about who, who earns the most, who does the most, who looks the best. It's, it's about the generosity that God has coming to us. And then, what else should we learn from this that we're invited and called to be generous to? God is incredibly generous for us. I don't care how long you've been a believer. I don't care how good of a person you are. I don't care how, how great of choices you've made. You are not the person that started in the morning. You and I are those people that showed up at 5 o'clock. A hundred percent of us are. And we rely on the generosity of God to experience his love, to experience his kingdom, to experience eternal life because of his generosity through Jesus. Not one of us has earned it. And so therefore, we respond in generosity as well. You absolutely should be looking in the bowl of your neighbor, 
not to see if you have as much as them, but to see if we can help them get some more. We can help them experience it better. The Magi, they came, you know, I, I think about this group of guys, this group of people who were born at, of a different tribe. They were not part of the, the people of God. They were not born into the favored, special people of God. And, and they could have easily, as they studied the stars, as they whatever it was that led them to understand that they were coming to find a king where this star was, they could have said, you know what? God didn't choose us or our people. He could have sent his son to one of us, but he didn't. Forget that. I'm not going to him and taking a gift. But instead they decided to gather up, to go on a journey that would take them years, and to bring gifts to offer to this newborn king. We're invited to be generous. We've got to stop looking for other people, looking at other people, trying to compare ourselves for our own sake. But we absolutely are called to be generous to, 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 to look for, for the needs that others have and help them with it. The kingdom of God does not live by the kingdom of the world's rules. The kingdom of God is a place where God's generosity goes way beyond what we could ever earn. And instead of shouting injustice, or life isn't fair, we are invited to be grateful for what God has given to us and to help others experience his goodness as well. After all, in the kingdom, the first will be last. 